Please rise. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The verse for our consideration we read just a couple of minutes ago. Once again, we are in Luke chapter 15 and we read, But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Here ends our reading. You may be seated. My brothers and sisters in Christ, last week we ended our sermon with this slide. The prodigal son was heading back home. He was broke, broken, and alone. He had been abandoned by his drinking buddies whose drinks he used to buy. He had been spurned by the prostitutes he used to entertain. And now, without a drachma to his name or a friend to commiserate with, he turned around and he headed home. I'm going to guess that many of us can sympathize with him having had to deal with our own pigsty moments. A recognizing how painful it can be when we look around and we see the mess that we ourselves caused and then we ask, how in the world did I get here? Of course, afterwards, it's, it's apparent And obvious, we were heading for a disaster all the way along the line. Our worship was either waning or it was non-existent, or when we were worshiping, we were just sort of going through the motions. But either way, it really doesn't matter. Either way, there was a disconnect from God, and when there is a disconnect from God, it always precedes a fall. The only question that we have is, how far a fall and how painful the landing? Well, for that prodigal son, his fall landed him in a pigsty. But here's the paradox. At the very moment of his absolute greatest humiliation, it was also at that moment a key step in his enlightenment. We read, when he came to his senses, he said, I will set out and go back to my father. So he set out on that long walk home uncertain of the reception that he was going to receive from his family after having fallen so far, so publicly, and so hard. For right now, why don't we skip the the father's reception, but suffice it to say, the dad was thrilled when his son returned. In fact, He was so thrilled that he decided to throw a party. But there was one man who was in no partying mood. We pick up our text. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, come home, you kill the fattened calf for him. I want you to notice what the older son said. Or more so, what the older son didn't say. Remember when the younger son decided that he was going to leave the pigsty and he was going to head back to his father? And he rehearsed that little speech inside his head? Remember how it started? Father, 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 I have sinned against you, Father. Yet, when the older son 
addresses his father. Never once in that entire tirade does he call him dad, does he call him father. The only thing that he could get out of that relationship with him is that somehow this man was his master and that his master had been grossly unfair with him. When you fall, you can count on having any number of older brothers and they are always going to be there to recount your failing. Always there to remind you of your past. Always there to recount all of the sordid details that accompanied your fall. Just like that older son did. We read, When this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes. And why? Why is it that there are older brothers like this? It's because they have not experienced the joy of grace. Everything for them is some form of duty. I've been been slaving for you. You see, that's how the older brother thought about what he was doing for his father. There was no joy. There was no thankfulness. There was no love. All it was was a a list of duties. And when he completed the duties, he had done enough, even though there was no affection whatsoever. And so the more that that older son thought about all of the things that he had done for his father the more he viewed it as a duty and began to choke on those bones of resentment. You never gave me. So, what do you do with this type of older brother? What do you do in your life when you have made a mistake It is clearly your own mistake, and yet there is somebody around you who is forever reminding you even after you have repented of that sin. Well, there are three things. First of all, you pray for them. You have to. There's there's no joy in their life. They haven't experienced grace. They haven't understood what grace means. And because they have not understood what grace means for them, it is difficult, if not impossible, to be able to show that grace to others. It is almost impossible to welcome back a fallen brother or sister because they haven't grasped the fact that they have been welcomed back. Step number one with an older brother, this type of older brother is pray. Number two, recognize the temporal consequence for sin. Now one of the things that that scripture plainly teaches is that the guilt of our sin has been removed. That is very clear in the Old Testament. It is very clear in the New Testament. But one thing that is clear in both Testaments is that while God will take away the eternal consequence for our sin, very often there remains a temporal consequence for our sins. In other words... Something that we have done have certain things that we have to live with. One of the results of a fall is that very often there are people who will be there to remind us of all of the details that led to our fall. But number three, this is most important, and that is to rejoice in the Father's reception. That father stood there waiting, watching, anticipating, looking for the return of his son. We said that that younger son had a plan, and that plan involved uh, reciting that mantra over and over again. Father, I will say, Father, I have sinned. The older son 
or the, the father also had a plan. His plan involved waiting for his child to come should he ever return from the pigsty. And so day after day, he sat in that village and he looked down the path and he looked down that path that he saw last his son walking away on. Full of all kinds of hope, full of all kinds of arrogance. Now that father knows that when his son returns, if he should return, that he can count on being met with that clay jar full of burning corn and the curses well earned of the villagers. He knew his son would be an outcast. But he also knew that his son would not be an outcast for him. You see, the father also had a plan. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Before his son could utter one syllable of that well-rehearsed apology, his dad interrupted him with hugs and kisses. There was going to be time for words later on. But at that moment, what that son needed more than anything was the father's physical proof of his acceptance. And after the tears were over, and after the hugs were over, Then that father spoke. But there was nothing that he spoke more significant than what was recorded in verse 24. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Do you notice what he called that recent resident of the pigsty? He called him son. Even more than that, he claimed that son as his own, this son of mine. Can you imagine that? What that son was so unsure of when he was sitting in the pigsty, what that son was so unsure of as he took all of those steps back to his father. Father, I will say, Father, I, I have repented. And then never was going to ask his father to accept him as a son. He said, my, my father is a fair man. Maybe he will accept me as one of his hired workers. What the son was unsure of That father never doubted. He loved his son. He loved him freely. He loved him recklessly. He loved him extravagantly. Come to think of it, wasn't that the definition we used last week when we talked about the word prodigal? Spending money or resources freely and recklessly, wastefully extravagant. So you see, the son wasn't the only prodigal in this story. In fact, the son wasn't even the primary prodigal in the story. It was the father all the time. It is the father. Your Heavenly Father has been prodigal with you. Last week we talked about what it means to be prodigal, that three baseball teams would spend a, a, in total a billion dollars on three baseball players. But you know, the one thing about a baseball owner is they can always find another way of earning interest or income. What do you say about a father who gives everything that he has in the form of his son? That is exactly what that father did 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. And he has given to us so much more than we are worth. He has given recklessly, joyfully, extravagantly. And this lavishness we have a name for. This lavishness of love, we call it grace. And it flows to the people who are so recently from the pigsties of life. Even more than that, that lavishness, we call it grace, flows to the people who are right now in the middle of the pigsties of life. And it comes in the form of being joyfully welcomed back into the presence of the Father. It comes when God welcomes us and forgives us, even though you and I have taken that grace which has saved us for granted. And it comes with being welcomed and being told that the Father has never ever once given up on you. Even when you have been in danger of giving up on yourself. What comfort, what power comes from being loved by a prodigal God? May we pray. Dear Father in heaven, help all of us who have come from the pigsties of life, help all of us who are maybe still in the pigsty of life, to recognize that you are the prodigal one. Lord, you have loved us freely and recklessly and extravagantly. May this be the, the power that we need to take those steps back to you, knowing that before we took our first step toward you, you already loved us, that you have loved us from eternity. Lord, one last prayer this morning after we have recognized your love for us, after we have basked in the glow of being accepted into your presence, help us to avoid ever being like the older brother in our text. May we be forgiven and may we shower our forgiveness and acceptance on those who are still struggling. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.